for everything in today's agenda. Uh, and so when you are ready, you can move on to the next slide. Great, I will be kicking everybody off today uh, because our lovely uh, chair and co-chair are both out of the office today. Uh, it is Dana's birthday. Um, so anybody uh, who is familiar with Dana Mitchell, our COC board chair, um, we encourage you to reach out to her just to wish her a very, very happy birthday. Uh, and our uh, vice chair, Susan Kent, is on a much needed and much deserved vacation. Uh, so I will uh, be taking us through uh, some of the stuff today until we get to our presentations. Um, and as you guys can see here, we have quite a full agenda. Um, and I will go ahead and move right on to the COC funding update. Um, so if you um, can take me to the next slide too. Okay, uh, it's that time of year, guys. Uh, the 2023 uh, 20, uh, HUD COC NOFO has been released. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar, uh, the COC NOFO is an annual competitive funding application um, for homeless assistance dollars through the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, HUD released the NOFO on uh, 7 5, uh, and the submission deadline is Thursday, September 28, 2023. Uh, anybody who's interested, in looking at the actual uh, million page document that the COC team gets to dig through every year. Um, it's available on uh, grants.gov, uh, HUD's funding opportunity page, and it will be available on the, D on the Delaware COC funding page, but it is not up there yet. Uh, and I apologize for that. Um, uh, just a little background for kind of what the uh, NOFO consists of. Uh, it's three different parts. Uh, first is the COC application, uh, which is a community application completed by um, the COC team here at HAD on behalf of the entire continuum of care. Um, and it really describes the COC's plan for preventing and ending homelessness. Uh, it takes into account our system level performance, um, and it addresses a ton of other selection criteria that makes us uh, uh, competitive against other COCs at the national level for funding. Uh, it also includes the priority listing, which is the full list of project applications that are submitted to the, the COC uh, and approved and ranked for funding. Uh, and lastly, it, it includes all of the individual project applications that were uh, approved and ranked by the COC. Um, for any of our project applicants that are on the call today, uh, HUD did state that the eSNAPS applications would be available later this month. Um, we don't have a confirmation on when that is, um, but as soon as we have more information, we will send that over to you guys. Um, and anybody uh, who's interested in kind of getting into the system um, or having any issues with eSNAPS, um, I have the TA uh, email right there, uh, which will be more relevant later. Um, and the NOFO release, it kicks off the uh, new project solicitation review and selection process at the local level. Uh, and I will talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, so uh, every year, um, Housing Alliance puts together the new project RFP um, on behalf of the COC, and that is available on the funding page currently. Um, new project applications through this RFP are due on, uh, by 4 o'clock p.m. on Wednesday, August 9th, uh, and late applications won't be accepted. Um, anybody who's interested in submitting a new project application uh, should review the RFP in detail um, to determine if and um, what they are eligible to apply for, um, of what they want to use the COC funds for, and other details um, that are important about the funding opportunity. Uh, and the new project RFP and all of the submission uh, materials are available, again, on the funding page. Uh, we are hosting a NOFO public meeting, uh, which is a NOFO new project, uh, renewal project meeting. Uh, it's virtual, uh, and the link's there and on the funding page. Uh, and this meeting will be utilized to provide details, updates, changes um, included in the NOFO that are re relevant for all applicants uh, and the community. Um, we will be going in detail over the new project RFP and application information, um, and we will be providing renewal projects 
project process updates uh, and um, additional eSNAPS application information. Um, all new project applicants are required to uh, be present at this meeting to be eligible to apply. Um, so if you are interested in submitting an application, uh, you definitely need to attend the meeting. I just want to make that very clear that any new project applicant definitely has to attend this meeting. Um, and we are requiring all renewal applicants attend the meeting as well. Um, however, you, uh, renewal projects uh, that aren't applying for new project funds are only uh, required to be uh, there to go over the NOFO uh, overview information and the renewal project relevant information, which will be towards the beginning of the meeting. Um, all of the new project application information will be towards the end um, so that uh, you guys are uh, can hop off uh, and utilize your time. Um, I do see a quick question in the chat. This is what types of uh, projects are funded. Um, the, the COC funding um, has very specific project types and eligible costs. Uh, and I, once I um, get done presenting, I can definitely throw a link in the chat for more information. Uh, but we fund primarily uh, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, uh, transitional rapid rehousing, uh, and uh, a couple other uh, legacy project types and COC infrastructure project types. But those are the three main project types um, that actually work with participants or house people that the COC uh, funds. Uh, and that includes a myriad of different um, dedicated projects, whether that's for uh, chronic homeless individuals, DV, uh, and stuff like that. So I will definitely provide more resources um, in the chat in just a minute. Um, and uh, Lisa, that is also available in the new project RFP that is on the website. It details that um, pretty, pretty well. Um, but you're always welcome to also follow up with me after um, for more information about that too. Okay, so I'm ready to move on too. Um, so we also are just going to do a really quick overview of the 2023 Pitt and Hick report. Um, you can go to the next slide, so. Um, so every year, HAD produces a narrative report to accompany the annual Pitt and Hick data submission um, that we submit to HUD on behalf of the um, Delaware COC. Uh, that report is available and has been published on the uh, reports page. Uh, the report itself includes an analysis of the unsheltered, uh, sheltered, and total pit counts for this year. Uh, it includes subpopulation data breakdowns by county and demographics. Uh, it includes a brief overview of Delaware's bed and unit inventory by project type. Uh, that's for specifically to uh, homeless assistance projects. Uh, and it includes the uh, actual actual um, data submission to HUD uh, as an appendix within the report. Um, you can move on to um, because the report is so great and available, we're not going to go over too uh, much detail um, about it today, but we did just want to present some of the main takeaways um, from the 2023 Pitt and Hick. Um, so some of the major changes um, from uh, 2022 to 2023 uh, can be explained um, specifically by the loss of federal relief funding um, for COVID-19. Uh, so our system was able to scale up quite a bit um, to shelter of people during the pandemic in the time of need. Um, so we did see the counts go up and the uh, of shelter availability go up. But as those relief funds dwindled back down, uh, system capacity um, followed relatively the same trajectory. Um, so the overall decrease in the numbers this year are, are uh, largely due to that. Um, unsheltered homelessness increased by 28%, uh, and this is the largest increase uh, in unsheltered homelessness uh, since 2008, uh, so a very, very long time. Uh, the unsheltered homeless count uh, increased uh, despite a couple of factors uh, that we thought would produce uh, an undercount this year. Um, several large encampments were cleared out right before the uh, unsheltered count took place, uh, and the unsheltered count took place during during um, a night where there was pretty heavy rain and wind throughout the state. Uh, so the fact that the it's increased by 28%, uh, despite some of the things that we uh, thought would produce an undercount, uh, is quite stark. Uh, and that's probably the most important takeaway from the entire pit and hit count this year, um, is that unsheltered homelessness does seem to be on the rise in Delaware, uh, which is quite a concern. 
Um, sheltered homelessness decreased by about um, 1,000 people, um, and available shelter beds decreased also by right around 1,000. Um, so that kind of hits home that first point that um, the changes can be largely due to uh, the decrease in, in COVID relief funding. Um, Additionally, one in four people on the night of the pit count was a child under 18. Uh, this is actually down from 2022, 20, uh, where it was one in three, um, so that is one positive. Uh, and lastly, Sussex County had a higher than proportionate rate of unsheltered homelessness uh, and lower than proportionate rate of uh, sheltered homelessness. And what we mean by that is when we look at county populations um, and the distribution within those counties, um, we would have expected those numbers of unsheltered uh, and sheltered homelessness um, to be quite a bit lower in Sussex County, um, but they are actually higher um, in, in comparison to the two northern counties. Um, so we can see that um, quite a bit of that increase uh, in unsheltered homelessness was actually represented in Sussex County. Um, so we utilize that data um, to help inform decisions and kind of help um, us figure out what's going on in the state. Um, so uh, we will, um, and we have a quite a bit of additional analysis um, in the report that's available on the website. Um, so anybody who's interested in learning more about um, some of the uh, more details around these main takeaways, um, please view the report. Um, and if you're interested in being involved in, in any of the solutions um, and planning that we do around uh, this data, um, please feel free to reach out to me directly, um, either to get involved in the pit this year um, or to um, figure out kind of what group, uh, what committee um, is, is best suited to uh, being involved in that. So that's it for main pit hit takeaways. Um, the next thing that I will be going through, and this is the last thing before I pass it off to our lovely committee chairs, um, is the 2023 uh, annual membership meeting. Um, so this year, the um, COC will be hosting the annual membership meeting in person. Uh, it will be the first time since 2019 that we will be hosting the event in person. Um, so we are very excited about that. Um, right now, uh, we will tentatively be holding the meeting on October 18th, 2023, um, and it will be a bit longer than our normal um, quarterly meetings. It's going to be from 9 to 1 instead of 10 to 12, uh, and that date is pending venue availability. Um, we are tentatively planning to host it in Kent County, um, but again, that is subject to change pending on venue availability. Um, so once we have confirmed a um, uh, uh, venue uh, and a date. We will have more information to come on uh, when and where the annual meeting will be taking place. Um, but we are requiring registration uh, since the meeting is going to be in person, and we do have that set up already. Uh, so everyone who is interested in pre-registering, um, we do encourage you to do so, um, and you can utilize that link. Uh, we will also be including it in the follow-up that goes out after the meeting today um, for that registration. Um, and again, as soon as we have a, a venue um, available and um date information available, we will be putting out uh, flyers and other promotional materials um, so that everybody knows when and where to go. And I believe that is it for me. Uh, I'm going to be passing it over to Sophie to go over um, committee schedule updates, and she is going to be taking it from there. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, before I hand it off to our lovely um, advocacy and policy chairs, I'm just going to go over a little bit of the committee schedule for this year. Um, we did have our previous meetings. We have the committee archives available via our public um, Google Drive folder, so you're more than welcome to review prior meeting materials and minutes there. As for upcoming meetings, um, September 13th, we'll have the Advocacy and Policy Committee meeting, as well as on September 20th, um, Racial Justice and Equity and System Solutions Committee will be meeting. Um, please feel free to join the meetings. If you um, aren't a member already, you can reach out to me for more information. Um, and we also do have our public um, committee calendar available um, here as well. And we'll make sure that these links are included as well with the meeting materials. And with that, I am going to pass it over to um, Nick Beard to cover our advocacy and policy committee. 
Thank you. I hope the start means that I am your favorite committee, Sophie. Um, for sure. We are so excited to be here. And I know people might be thinking, but it's July. What is there to do with the Advocacy and Policy Committee? Well, I think we did some great things next year, and we're very excited for what's next. Uh, so if you want to switch to the next slide for me. All right. What happened in 2023? Um, I would say some of the best news we have is regarding funding. I know there's always discussion of housing funding um, and if there will be adequate funding, but we were really excited um, that there has been funding for DSHA, the Delaware State Housing Authority, which we know does great work for low-income housing, that the governor's budget included affordable housing. And uh, Tony, I would be remiss to Tony if I didn't say that obviously after the many, many years of fighting, uh, we were able to get right to representation passed in Delaware. This is something that we had worked long and hard on because we all know that if someone is evicted from affordable housing, it can often be incredibly different to find other housing. So making sure that we support low-income people, make sure that they are able to provide options rather than eviction is so essential. So shout out to Classy, the ACLU, DSHJ and everyone else who did such amazing work uh, on this campaign. I will say that something to be aware of, if you're thinking that sounds great, what else is there to do, um, is SB 99, which removes the local crime-free ordinances. We know that there are a good few in Delaware, uh, local crime-free ordinance that require landlords to evict someone who uh, might have a certain number of police calls or some other type of law enforcement involvement. Those tend not to be enforceable at the municipal level, um, but they are still on the books. And we know that landlords often look at those when crafting leases. So while this bill passed the Senate, yay, um, we are coming back strong in January, hoping to get it done um, through both chambers. So a lot of great stuff happening, but a lot more to do. Uh, and I will ask you guys to move on to the next slide for me. Um, and say that there is still fun things happening. I say fun and I'm hoping no one is rolling their eyes, uh, but there's still a lot of things happening in the off season. One great example is that there has been a request for input about renter protections. And we know that this is something that we spend a lot of time talking, thinking about, and a lot of you do on the field. Tony has graciously offered to draft some comments that people can use and adapt. But I'm sure a lot of you have thoughts. If you need any help turning that into something that you can submit, please let us know. We're really eager to make sure that they hear such a wide variety of people's experiences. We'll also say that we're so excited this year to be helping with the Homeless Persons Memorial Day. I know it's a great event that brings together so many of us and our partners. So the Advocacy and Policy Committee will definitely be having a presence there this year. Now, if you heard that and said, you know what? I wanna help with all that. I think that you should attend our next meeting on September 13th. We'd love to have you. And it's always uh, great to catch up with people, hear what people are working on and kind of make sure that we're coordinating as a community. So we'd love to see more of you there next time. Thanks so much, Sophie. Thank you so much, Nick. You're um, always a pleasure to bring so much uh, passion and fun to everything. And again, if anybody has any questions um, about joining the next meeting or anything we're doing, feel free to reach out to me, feel free to reach out to Nick. Um, and all of that information is available on our Google archives um, as well, too. And actually, to kind of um, kick it off next, I am covering for Rachel a little bit today, but I'm going to be talking about some of the things coming up with the Centralized Intake Committee. Um, currently, we have a provider survey out for all of our um, different uh, homeless assistance and service providers that are currently working with centralized intake. Um, we'd love for everyone to please take a few minutes of your time to um, submit your responses via the survey. Um, all responses are anonymous. Um, uh, the deadline is for August 1st for that. And if you do have any follow-up questions, please let me know. And I think everyone should have received also um, a blast email, I think about a week or so ago with that information as well, as well as the link. Um, and we are also looking for um, shelter partners for client focus groups. Um, we're just looking for anybody that would be interested in partnering with us to host um, focus groups with clients. If you are interested or if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. 
Um, and last but certainly not least, we will be hosting our centralized intake community meeting. It's going to be on Wednesday, August 23rd from 9.30 to 12 o'clock. Um, this is also going to be in person. We're hosting it at Dover Public Library. Um, registration is required in advance. Um, we will be also be having light refreshments. Um, the purpose of this meeting is really just to um, gather feedback from you guys in person. We're going to be discussing some of the results from the feedback survey as well, um, provide any information, um, up-to-date resources, um, and just kind of really have a good communication and conversation about what's going on in CI and hearing from you as well if you're working directly with clients. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email um, about any of these topics that we covered. All righty, and that is it for me. Um, I think I'm going to be passing it over to Felicia currently now, too. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be giving the Racial Justice and Equity um, Committee update. Um, currently, right now, they are um, reviewing the anti-discrimination um, COC policy. Um, what that is, is um, a, well, federal law prohibits discrimination in housing and community development programs. Um, so what this policy does is just ensures that programs and activities um, are rendered, um, rendered um, not, you know, not, I'm sorry, not discriminated against. Um, based on race, color, religion, sex, um, sexual orientation, national origin, familial status, and disability. Um, so who would this policy apply to? It applies to recipients of um, HUD financial assistance. So any of our COC um, funded um, service providers um, are required to um, render services using non-discriminatory practices. Um, and our committee um, is reviewing that policy until July 17th. Um, which is coming up um, shortly. Um, but if anyone here on the call or anyone in the committee would like to um, provide commentary on that policy, um, please reach out to me to be added to the Google Doc. Um, again, it's um, going to be reviewed until July 17th. But if anyone is um, interested, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, lastly, the committee is also working on um, racial disparities data um, analysis. So um, what this data is, um, is HUD, HUD requires COCs to report on racial disparities data. Um, that data mostly comes from CMIS. For those of you who are um, familiar, that is our um, homelessness management system um, where our service providers enter um, data on our clients. Um, so um, Delaware, Delaware's system is currently overwhelmingly 63% Black and African American. Uh, we know this by um, reviewing CMIS data. Um, so that's part of um, this an the analysis um, that is done every year. Um, so who does this apply to? Um, the racial disparities data um, from CMIS is relied on by other entities of the state that work with individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, what this data does is it helps us guide initiatives and provide statistics um, that back up the need for important legislation, like some of the legislation that we heard um, just a minute ago, um, and policy changes. Um, these um, statistics um, usually help us um, inform the public. Um, one thing, one way that we've done that in the past is the statistics were used at the fiscal year 22 um, town hall. Um, so um, for anyone who attended um, the town hall last year and um, heard about the facts, um, heard about the facts and statistics that came out of that, um, that was, um, that came directly from CMIS data. Um, so the committee will be doing a full review and analysis um, on this data um, that will be coming in the coming weeks. Um, so if you are interested in the data, uh, if you uh, want to look at it, want to provide any analysis, feedback, please feel free to join the Racial Justice and Equity Committee. Um, our next meeting is September 13th as well. Um, so please um, feel free to uh, reach out to Sophie if you'd like to join that committee um, or reach out to myself or Paula, which are the chair um, for any questions. All right, thank you so much, Felicia. Um, next we have Devana Field. She is our system solutions co-chair and Devana, whenever you're ready, 
we can kick it off. Good morning, everybody. Um, again, I'll be giving the update for our system solutions committee. Can you hear me? Got it. Um, first thing we'll start off with is an SPM overview. The COCs are required to collect and submit the above uh, performance measures to HUD annually. So as you can see, it's the length of time homeless, return to homelessness, number of homeless persons, jobs and income growth, first time homelessness, permanent housing, placement and retention. So the purpose of these SPMs is to provide an overall picture of how well our response system um, is making progress in preventing and ending homelessness. Um, this data allows us to, in our communities to evaluate our and improve our performance. Um, it can reveal insights, obviously, about the, our assistance programs, how well they're functioning as a whole, and how we can identify gaps in data and services. So obviously, um, HAD is our lead agency, is responsible for the timely and accurate submission of these SPMs each year. Um, and what our committee does is that that we review these um, SPMs to help evaluate our system's performance. Um, we analyze the trends, identify service gaps, and then make recommendations, implement strategies for improvement. Um, so the HAD drafts a narrative report um, to accompany our COC's annual SPM data submission. Um, this helps to provide for the detail and um, analyze our performance outcomes. And we review this report in our system solution committee prior to publication. And then we also use this to analyze uh, is utilized to help inform the other COCs of priorities and planning. Um, one, two things that were added to the report this year was the definition section and understanding the system performance data section was great um, because it was very helpful and I think added clarification to the report. Next screen, next slide. Here you'll see some of our um, SPM highlights. There's, as you can see in the below, there's the negative and positive. So one of the negatives obviously is that 40% of the homeless people who exited the assistance project exited to permanent housing. This was a decrease from our previous FY21 year. Um, a positive is that 10% of the people who exit homelessness to a permanent housing destination returned to homelessness again within two years. And this was a decrease from um, FY21. So that is good. Um, um, another positive is that 98% of the people who served in permanent supportive housing remain stably housed in their housing project or either moved to another permanent housing destination, which was great. Um, one negative that was found is that the average length of time for a homeless person, um, the length of time that they spent rather be a homeless in emergency shelters increased by 25 days. So that is something that we'll probably need to look at. Um, and then also uh, another positive is that 78% of our people in FY22 who experienced homelessness for the first time was decreased from the previous FY21 year, which was 82%. So that's a great, a positive, definitely. Um, so overall, um, our systems performance report includes strategies that we as a whole can implement to improve our homeless response systems performance outcomes. Our committee looked at and reviewed and selected some of the high level strategies so that we can begin um, action planning and implementation for the remainder of this year on into early 2024 year to promote um, system performance improvements. And so you'll see the three um, strategies listed below. Um, the first one is that we want to increase available units by promoting and facilitating recruitment of new landlords and retention, obviously, of existing landlords. Um, the second one is that we want to identify target uh, mainstream housing service resources um, to partner with, um, and then also leverage this to help build uh, or help fill identified gaps. Um, and I will say one of the things that we, uh, in discussion with this, that may relate to this is that for we noted in our last meeting um, that some of our organizations within the state do not utilize CMIS. And so if you know of any organization or can give input on that, that would be great. We wanna encourage those organizations to utilize that database so that we can more accurately um, assess and then implement strategies to um, improve the homelessness state in our, within our state. 
Um, the third one there is that we want to establish system-wide performance goals, um, short and long-term. So an example of this is that our Delaware COC will reduce the average length of time homeless by 10 days over the next two years. So that's an example of that. So these are um, three of the strategies that we picked to work on over this rest remainder of this year and into early 2024 year. Um, anyone who's interested or have input in any of these strategies are welcome to join the committee and help um, work on them. Um, you can join us at our next meeting, September 20th at 2 p.m. Um, feel free to reach out to Kim, uh, myself, or Aaron, whose um, email addresses are listed below. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devana. Hmm? Um, and I think Alicia is going to talk about our upcoming COC training in a moment as well. Yeah, so um, we have um, an upcoming COC training, Applied Housing First and Harm Reduction Strategies. Um, in the past, we have done um, Housing First and Harm Reduction trainings. This training is going to specifically focus on the how. So what does Housing First actually look like um, when it is implemented? Um, so um, this training will be required for all of our COC funded um, organizations, but it is open to anyone who is interested in learning more about the topic. Um, the registration, I will drop the registration link in the chat in just a minute, um, but for anyone who's interested in attending this training, please feel free to register. Uh, register registration is free. Thank you. I will also add, in addition, coming off the system performance improvement slides, uh, one of the main um, improvement strategies that HUD really promotes COCs to adopt uh, is encouraging and implementing housing-focused case management practices um, and very housing-focused uh, practices. Um, so anybody who is interested in learning more about that, we really do encourage you to attend this training. Uh, as Felicia said, it's going to be focused on kind of the how that looks and how that's implemented within programs. Um, and it is uh, very important uh, for system performance um, for our homeless response system at all, uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, so I just wanted to add that little tidbit that uh, this is also um, another thing that is uh, promotes our uh, homeless response system performance as well. All right. Thank you guys so much. Again, um, registration is included here. Um, Felicia will be putting that in the chat momentarily. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either of us. Next, we have our CMIS onboarding, and we're going to have Amelia, um, our CMIS program manager here at HAD, um, present for you guys. Amelia, whenever you are ready. Just... Yep, I'm ready to go. Thank you, Devana, for basically introducing what I'm here to do today during this meeting. Um, Sophie, I don't know if the slides are on there. You can change. Yes. So um, just in case um, anybody on this call doesn't know, every CLC is required to have some form of HMIS to track homeless service uh, programs provided um, in their CLC, as well as the clients being served in those programs. Um, CMIS is Delaware's local, uh, well, statewide implementation of HMIS, um, which nationwide is called a uh, homeless management information system. Um, in order for our COC to provide a thorough and comprehensive picture of homelessness and services available in that realm in the state of Delaware, um, we do need as many programs as possible entering data into the system, hence me making this request today. Um, we have about 36 agencies currently entering their programs data into CMIS, and we're certainly looking for more to join us. Um, if you operate any of these of the listed programs on this slide or any other program that exists to serve the homeless population, um, we'd love to have you on board CMISC. Uh, this ask is like a little informal, and I'm aware of that. I'm not providing too much information to keep things short, um, but I am open to meeting with folks one on one to talk a little bit more in depth about what CMIS participation um, would entail. Um, so Jean just asked a question, What? Uh, where are your drop-in centers? So these are like community day shelters. Um, so examples would be like St. Patrick's or um, cre uh, Creative Vision Factory. So um, that kind of uh, would be an example of supportive services available that also enter data in CMIS. Um, Sophie, you can go ahead and change the slide. 
Um, so there is a fee involved with CMI's participation, but it is literally just to purchase licenses to access the system. Um, Housing Alliance Delaware provides the rest, training technical assistance throughout the year, um, helping with reporting, and you would also get access to client level data throughout the COC. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot to offer by joining CMIS. Um, while onboarding can happen any time of the year, this is a year round process that we uh, help with. Um, the next few months are the ideal time to start planning um, because we are renewing our contracts with our CMIS vendor, as well as prepping for a new fiscal uh, year with HUD. So this just happens to be the best time of year to do that. So um, even if you don't think this is the time to join CMIS, we would also love to hear from you um, just to hear about the new programs that may have emerged during the pandemic. Um, for federal reporting, we also want to make sure you guys get included one way or another. Um, we do an annual check-in during the point in time in the housing inventory count, which was mentioned previously, um, that all gets involved with CMIS. Um, so my contact information is here, my email address is there, and I'll also be on this call for about 45 minutes if anyone is interested in learning more or have any questions. And thank you. I saw some questions, so I just want to make sure um, if there's anything relating to what I mentioned. Um, there is actually, um, Jean asked a question about drop-in centers for unaccompanied youth. I do know West End Neighborhood House has the home base drop-in center in Wilmington. Um, I don't have the address off the top of my head, but that is a service available in Wilmington. Um, and then I stand corrected about Creative Vision Factory, um, but there are services around the state where you know, they play as day shelters. And again, that could be an access point for like centralized and taking access to services. So um, if Sophie, if you can just go back one slide. Um, yes. Again, um, emergency shelters are and transitional housing programs are huge for the point in time count um, and the other federal reporting we talked about. Emergency shelter also includes hotel and motel stays that are uh, where the funding is provided by an organization. So I know that that is one that uh, has increased over the pandemic. So that's why I also just wanted to point that one out. Um, but there are a lot of services I know that are available that we at within the CMI program may not be uh, aware of. So we definitely love to hear from everyone or anyone that is not in the system already. That's all I have. Thank you. I would add in addition um, that while we um, primarily prioritize projects that are um, like homeless dedicated or homeless specific, um, there are several um, like organizations and um, providers and, and things like that that might not be homeless dedicated, but do serve large portions of the homeless population, uh, like Creative Vision Factory. Um, and so we do definitely still encourage those um, organizations to participate in the system um, when it comes to their um, homeless clients. Um, that way we can get an um, accurate picture of kind of what's going on in Delaware and we can make sure that uh, we are tailoring our solutions um, and recommendations um, for how to address uh, all of the things happening in the state uh, in the most accurate way possible. Um, so it's not just for homeless specific projects, even though they are the priority, uh, it can be used by um, anybody who is serving um, people experiencing homelessness. Alrighty, thank you guys both so much. Um, next, we have um, Stephen Piquet with the Delaware Journal of Public Health. Um, he was actually one of the co-authors on a article um, covering homelessness in Delaware. Um, Steve, whenever you're ready, I can get us started. Great, thank you, Sophie. Um, well, I'm glad to be here. And um, the article that I'm gonna be talking about um, that Sophie mentioned is uh, in last month's uh, edition of the Delaware Journal of Public Health entitled Homelessness in Delaware and Assessment. And um, for those that perhaps don't know me, um, I did the first statewide study of homelessness uh, in Delaware in 1987, um, although I don't look that old, I hope. And um, I did a major reassessment of the situation in 2007, which was 20 years of research on, on the problem of homelessness in the state. And uh, Steve Metro uh, and I thought it would be a good idea to kind of reassess the homeless situation 
And we did so and published it in the article that I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, the, um, the, I also have you know, a, a substantial amount of experience and background in establishing the Delaware HMIS, uh, which was in, I think it was in 2006 or seven. Uh, but anyway, um, so I go back a fairly long way with respect to the problem of homelessness. And um, I was also the director of the Center for Community Research and Service at the University of Delaware, which uh, Steve Metro is my successor. And, um, uh, and so the center is uh, continuing its concern and focus uh, on the issue of homelessness and is very pleased to be able to work with all of you and, um, and others to essentially continue to address the problem. The, um, uh, the, uh, the unfortunate, you know, I guess, um, conclusion in the, in the article um, is that the problem of homelessness in Delaware is actually increasing at a fairly rapid rate. Um, between 2006 and 2018, the number of homeless persons counted on a specific night uh, in the state um, stayed very, fairly level. So that was, you know, a, a rather a 12 year period um, and it varied between 901 and 130, uh, nine, uh, excuse me, 1,030. And, um, uh, but that situation changed rather dramatically uh, starting in, in uh, uh, just after 2011, excuse me, 2019. Um, homelessness as a percentage of the population fell earlier on um, in, the, in, the, in that decade, but, uh, since 2019, the population has increased at a, at a rapid rate. Um, and, and, and that's, if, if we go back to the previous slide, um, so that would be great. Um, uh, one, uh, yeah, uh, okay, I think the slides are in a different order than I, I had expected. Oh, so go ahead, go ahead forward. I can uh, skip around for you if you'd like, give me one moment. Yeah, yeah, the slide that actually shows total homeless population in Delaware 2006 to 2022. That's it. That's that's the one. I apologize. Uh, so yeah. So you you so you see a, a dramatic change starting in 2019, uh, and and that's that's a real change, um, and it's been picked up in a variety of different indicators, in, including the the, the PIT. Um, so so this dramatic change is quite worrisome, and it's a it's a dramatic change in numbers, and it's a dramatic change and the actual the percentage of the population uh, in the state that are homeless. And Delaware, unfortunately, now in the last three years um, has essentially had a rate of homelessness growth that is higher than any state in the country. Um, and so that's, you know, after all the hard work that's been done for many, many years and all the work that all of you do, um, our job is obviously not done. We, we, have, we have continuing to, um, have to work hard to meet the challenge of trying to deal with this uh, with this with this serious problem. Um, so um, let, let's go to the next slide, if you would. Um, and uh, and and that's an in, this is an indication that uh, we have to be careful about the way we um, actually count the homeless population. And this pertains more generally to um, the the challenges that we face with respect to how we enumerate. Who are who's homeless and the characteristics of the homeless population? Um, what what has happened? The 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 the, the brief story here is that um, you know preceding the pandemic, we saw the beginning of this uptick in the homeless population, and then of course the pandemic hit um, in 2020, and the um, uh, there was a, a, a substantial infusion of federal money uh, to deal with. Um, you know, essentially to deal with the pandemic. Uh, and the service delivery system shifted from the traditional focus on transitional emergency and transitional housing to um, a very strong focus on the utilization of um, hotel and motel vouchers. Um, and then that money, of course, is dried up now um, since the pandemic has come to a close. Uh, thankfully, that the, the pandemic is, is um, you know, uh, has, has substantially reduced, um, but the money uh, focused on trying to help individuals deal with their shelter issues um, has also been se severely reduced. And so the indicators, um, the way we count homeless, the homeless population um, essentially shows that there's a downtick 
um, and and the number of sheltered pot, uh, number of sheltered uh, people in in in, um, in homeless facilities. Uh, but that's that's a misleading indicator of the number of uh, of homeless people that are out there. And it's, it has a lot to do with the way we count the homeless uh, through the um, uh, HMIS um, and, and not at the fault of the HMIS, it's just that the HMIS is focused on counting people that are actually touching the, the um, sheltered, you know, homeless shelter delivery system. Um, we know that there are a lot of homeless people out there that are not touching that system. Um, and it's important for us to try to understand why that's the case. Uh, but the data that we have from 2019 to the present indicates uh, that the population is growing. Um, and um, what's also happened, of course, is that the actual number of shelter beds, especially motel um, uh, hotel vouchers has, has decreased. Um, so if you please go on to the next slide. Um, the, the um, yeah, that's great. Now, th this is the unsheltered point in time counts that, uh, that's already been alluded to uh, by Aaron. Um, and you know it's you know the, the numbers are are growing and and it's startling to see that we're we're seeing this kind of increase. Uh, next slide, please. And that's some additional data, um, which is um, um, very much described in the um, in the uh, PIT um, report for two thousand and and, um, and twenty three. Um, so I, I, I want to essentially, um, I do encourage you all to read um, the, the, um, the article that's, that's available online uh, through the Delaware um, Public Health, uh, the, uh, the Journal of Public Health, and, um, and also see the other articles that I think are a very nice uh, group of articles that help people understand the nature and characteristics of the homeless problem in the state. Uh, I very much commend um, the, 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 the efforts of the, of the authors to put this information together. And I think that we are at a stage now in which we need to do as much of a full comprehensive reevaluation and assessment of the problem of homelessness, um, you know, in the, and say in the next coming year, the next year and a half, because it's been 16 years since we've really done a full blown, um, um, you know, uh, assessment of the, of the situation. But let me uh, just summarize the major takeaways from the article. Uh, the number and percent of homeless people in the state has, uh, has been increasing at a rapid rate uh, since 2019. Uh, that measurement of, the measurement of shelter capacity is a misleading indicator in, in some respects uh, of the true size of the characteristics of the homeless population over, over time. Um, and, the, and the configuration of the shelter system, there's indications that that configuration, its location and their entry rules and, and target populations um, do not always adequately reflect the needs and characteristics of the state's homeless population. And so we need to assess that. To what extent is there a reasonable correspondence between the nature of the services that are available and the kinds of needs that, 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 that people have uh, who are experiencing homelessness? Um, uh, the, an, another point is that we need to improve our data collection efforts and system to better account and monitor the size and characteristics of the homeless population. And that's in no way a criticism of the, of the, um, of the CMIS. Um, I, as I said, I have a long history in the creation of the CMIS, and I'm very pleased at the way it's uh, personally has, has uh, evolved over the last several years. Um, but we, we need to always try to make um, that system um, uh, as robust and as capable as possible. There was an invitation that was you know, made uh, just a few minutes ago to encourage agencies to be a part of the HMIS. And I think that that's critically important to do, but we also need to find other ways of perhaps enhancing the point in time um, survey. Uh, homeless people are incredibly difficult to identify and to enumerate. Uh, people that show up in shelters are easy, easier to identify, but we know that there are, are many people who are unsheltered, who are experiencing homelessness, who are doubled up, who are living um, under threats of domestic violence, who can reasonably be thought of as being homeless or certainly shelter insecure. And so we need to find uh, increasingly better ways to essentially identify and enumerate people and understand what their what their service care what their service needs actually are. Um, and the last point I'll make is that we need, you know, we need uh, to to again um, 
analyze um, and, and, and take stock into the extent to which different public policies are uh, actually improving the situation. We have evidence that the situation is getting worse. There have been very strong efforts to provide um, better services and, and, and more enriched services to the homeless population, yet we are still seeing an increase in this population, which is, which is quite worrisome. So we need to, to, to analyze and assess the situation on a continuing basis, but I think a full substantial um, reassessment of the situation is in order, and perhaps the Center for Community Research and Service and Steve Metro and his colleagues there in the center can be helpful working with all of you uh, to help um, you know, carry on that kind of research. And it's not just research for research purposes, it's research with a real purpose to understand the scope and scale um, of the population, uh, of the need uh, of the population and, and its needs, and to try to understand what programs are being, um, are having an impact uh, and, and therefore uh, also what, what, how we should spend our resources, our limited resources to address the problem of homelessness in the state. So on behalf of Steve Metro, my co-author and my, myself, thank you for inviting me and I, and, I, uh, and I applaud all of you for the very substantial work that's being done to, to address this problem. There's a link um, in the in the slides to the um, uh, to the to the journal article, and I encourage you all to take some time to to read not only the article I just presented, but the other articles that are in the uh, in, in the journal. Are there any questions? Um, Sue, um, Brian uh, put a question in the chat um, about the charts for the um, sheltered count, um, and I just wanted to um, verbally uh, communicate to everybody on the meeting. Um, so the overall total pit count and the sheltered pit count do show a decrease from um, 2022 to 2023. Um, however, this is directly related to the COVID relief funding um, and the beds uh, and system capacity that were produced out of that. Um, within the 2023 PIT report, there is an analysis of the sheltered count um, when taking COVID-19 years out of it. Um, so taking kind of that impact of the relief funding. Um, and when um, you look at it um, independent of the COVID-19 years, uh, it does still show that uh, sheltered homelessness is trending upward and is increasing over time. Um, so even though there, uh, it, the it's a little misleading um, sometimes in the charts when you see there's a big dip um, that is directly uh, related to a reduction in resources and system capacity, um, not uh, a, a decrease in the need or the number of people who um, are experiencing homelessness. Um, so that is is uh, pretty outlined um, and pretty uh, detailed in the report um, for anybody who wants to look at that in, in more detail. Aaron, that's that's very well stated, and it's very much the case that we, um, you know, measuring um, beds and capacity is one form of measurement. That's an important measurement, uh, but it doesn't. It can be misleading um, to essentially draw a strict parallel between those resources and the actual number of people that are homeless. Because what what we've experienced uh, and 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 learned from the pandemic is that when you expand the shelter capacity, in this case, through the motel, uh, hotel, motel voucher program, um, there are people that are out there who are in need of, of those services. Uh, and um, if we're not careful, those people can go uncounted. Um, you know, if, the, if that kind of, um, you know, shelter assist, that kind of shelter program isn't available anymore. Uh, so we know that there are, there are, there's a hidden um, there's a hidden, um, you know, uh, level of need out there that that we that we oftentimes can't see until there's an expansion of something like the motel hotel shelter um, 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 voucher program, and and then that need becomes expressed because that service is available. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Welcome, thank you. 
Thank you again, Steve, so much. Um, if we don't have any other questions, we will be moving on to the next topic. Um, I will say that I know we had previously sent out the article before, but um, we'll make sure that we include the link as well when we send out our follow-up meeting materials for everybody so that way they are able to, everyone can um, go ahead and view the article when they have time as well. Great, I, I think there was one more um, related to uh, the number of Hope Center beds. Um, so I um, have available the number of beds that were included um, for the HIC, um, but that was um, earlier in the year. I'm not quite updated on the number of beds um, currently being provided at the um, Hope Center. Um, so Carol, I can um, look into that in more detail and follow up with you um, for that. I just don't have the number off the top of my head. Now you're good. Thank you. All right, and next we have with us um, Kim Eppelheimer with Friendship House, and she is going to be talking about um, Code Orange, uh, a new initiative that they are going to be um, working on this summer. Kim? Yes, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction, Sophia. You can jump right into the next slide. Um, one more. Sorry. Thank you. No, there we are. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yes, so French of Us decided to institute a new program called Code Orange. Um, basically, the idea is the temperatures are continually getting hotter in our community, especially in Wilmington, where it's a traditional city. It is um, expected to be excessively hot this summer and pretty much every summer going forward. Knowing how incredibly dangerous heat is, um, especially, especially when you have excessive exposure and if you have any underlying conditions, it is deadly. We knew it was time to do something about this. And so we've decided to provide daytime air conditioning options for folks when other agencies, including us, would normally not be open. So basically what this looks like is being opened on weekends in both right now, it's Wilmington and Newark. That's where we have our resources available to offer this service. Um, and it is active now. We've already done two Code Oranges. We opened on July 4th because we're traditionally closed that day and so are many other organizations. And we did it the following Saturday. So we've done two in both of these locations. Um, the idea is that it is open for all. There's no pre-registration that is required and I'll kind of get into that next slide. But we really are trying to open up space so people can get off the streets during the hottest hours of the day. Um, the two locations, we have one in Wilmington. It is at our Wilmington Empowerment Center, which is one of our day centers, drop-in centers that's opened Monday through Friday, normally also Sunday mornings. And that's the address, 720 North Orange Street. Our other location is in Newark at the Calvary Baptist Church, who's one of our partners. And the hours in which we're offering Code Orange on the weekends is from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And again, we're doing weekends because we're already open to anyone during the daytime on weekdays, Monday through Friday. So we have um, volunteers and we have staff on site um, at these locations. Um, we will be calling a code orange essentially 24 hours ahead. Very quickly, we've learned how difficult it is with summer temperatures. We've pseudo mastered how to do the winter temperatures. We have a better sense of how that works for code purple, but the summer temperatures are a lot more finicky. And this is largely due to thunderstorms. You know, that can drop a temperature very quickly. But as we saw recently, thunderstorms are also very dangerous. So we still will stay open even if the temperatures are expected to be high. They may drop due to severe storms. We still should be open because we have very severe weather and tornadoes that can hit Delaware. So it's still it's still dicey. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so basically some information about how to access, what to expect, et cetera. Um, as I mentioned, we do not expect or require any referrals. This is an open invitation for people. So if you know folks that are in Wilmington or Newark or anywhere in Newcastle County that are gonna need the Code Orange Shelter, they are encouraged to come and just show up. We will ask people to sign in. So we are gonna take um, a log of people that come, but we're not gonna do any intakes. We're not doing any excessive information. This is emergency daytime shelter and we're gonna treat it as, as such. 
Um, we are interested and willing to consider doing this in Kent and in Sussex, depending on what resources and what other organizations are doing. So we have a center in Dover currently, and we're working on opening that up for Code Orange. We're working on getting the resources and volunteers. We have um, some services in Sussex. We don't have a location that is a dedicated space for a French spouse in Sussex but we are interested and willing to make this a statewide initiative. And that's pretty much our, our next step. As I mentioned, we do have volunteers and staff that are on site at every Code Orange, but we're not providing our traditional services during a Code Orange weekend. Even though we have staff, we have caseworkers, the focus is really gonna be emergency shelter. Um, like I said, we will not be doing intakes, but we're gonna just track the folks that do come. What we'll do is if anybody's in need of services, we'll encourage them to come during our normal working hours to access services. Now, all that said, what we do have on site will be water, bathrooms. Um, we always have an emergency stash of bus tickets, but it's usually limited on things like on um, moments like this. And then we typically have access to things such as socks, um, other emergency things that folks may need in that moment. We're just not going to case manage during our, our code orange. Um, a couple of other just sort of opportunities that exist is we are open to more volunteers. So if you're interested in partaking in this, we would welcome you to come and sign up to be a volunteer. No training is required. And because this is a new initiative that we weren't budgeting for, we are um, open to monetary donations as well. So we don't do this through government funding. This is something that Friendship House funds completely on our own. Um, so we are dependent on the community to support our organization and we use our donations to support things such as Code Orange. Other supplies that we would be welcome to are hot and cold cups, even though it will be 100 degrees outside and we're doing Code Orange, our folks love coffee anyway. So we will provide ice water and coffee. Um, paper towels and plastic bags are always in need for people. So just some quick information on, on how people can support. When we call a code orange, it will go out on our social media sites and we will send an email to our key partners who need to know. Um, we don't have a master distribution list, but we are very transparent about it on our social media site. So for people who need to access Code Orange, we encourage them to reach out to any of our empowerment centers. They can all respond whether or not a Code Orange will happen on the weekend. They should reach out to us on the Friday ahead of time. Um, and then if possible, check our Facebook, check our LinkedIn, check our Instagram, all of that. And all of those sites are accessible through our website, you can link to any of our social media sites and follow us there as well. Also on our website are the locations, hours, addresses of our empowerment centers. So during the Monday through Friday hours, if people need access to a drop-in center, then they are open to all. Appointments are not required and anyone can come if they need some respite during, during the summer. Um, so the final slide is just um, if anyone has any questions, but it's also ways to contact if you want to follow up, there's our website, our office phone number, our helpline number, which is for recordings only, but we always get back to people within 24 to 48 hours. And then my information, if anybody wants to reach out specifically, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to take those now. Hearing none, I will go ahead and pass it on. And thank you so much for letting me share about this. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kim. And give me one moment. I'm going to, I'll be honest, I'm having, I can't, I'm not seeing the chat right now. I want to just make sure we didn't get any questions. Um, no, we didn't we're good. Oh, um, yeah. thank you. Yep. <laughs> All righty. Um, moving on to our next topic, we are going to be um, covering youth homelessness working groups. And we have Stacy with um, West End Neighborhood House. Um, here today to talk cover that for us. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Stacey Schamberger. I am the director for the Lifelines program at West End Neighborhood House. Uh, please forgive me as my camera is one way and the screen is another. So if I'm not facing you, uh, but I am paying attention. Um, I am gonna give you all a bit of information on our the youth homeless um, demonstration program um, funded through HUD. Please bear with me, I am learning as I go. So we just had our larger meeting yesterday. 
um, which was more of an information session. So uh, a representative from the National Network for Youth um, came down to be able to meet with a few of us um, and basically go over what the actual um, funding opportunity is, um, how to potentially approach the funding opportunity, um, what we need as far as Delaware as a whole to put in place in order to make that happen. Um, and there is a lot uh, of information. There's a lot of work to do, um, but I'm pretty sure, you know, as a team, as a group, as a state, um, we can come together and hopefully be able to get this done. And of course, with the support of our COC, uh, because they are the only ones that can apply. So we can't apply as individual agencies um, but we will work with the COC to hopefully be able to get all of this done. Um, I will take questions at the end, um, but I don't mind um, if you want to email me your questions and I am not the foremost leading expert, um, so please bear with me. But uh, as stated, the COCs are really the only ones that can apply for the funding, um, but this funding will allow the community as a whole, Delaware as a whole, to come together to provide supportive services, um, programming, housing, all of the above to support homeless youth. Um, one of the major factors that we need to make sure that we are focusing on um, in order to even be in a position to apply for the YHCP funding uh, is that we have a what's called a YAP, so a youth action board. Um, it needs to be youth ran, youth led, youth developed, um, the whole nine and statewide. So all of the players um, in the state that support and service homeless youth would need to be um, involved. And an agreement has to be signed, like this is absolutely a team effort. So um, these meetings are imperative as you know we continue to move forward. Um, we are provided with technical assistance through HUD. So there is some funding available uh, in order for us to have that technical assistance. Um, we are the first meeting that we just had today, um, again, or excuse me, yesterday, through um, the National Network for Youth was supported through their TA. Um, and then they'll continue to provide support for us also um, as we grow and as we develop, um, and hopefully as we garner enough support to be able to make this happen. Um, there are, oh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of money that is available for this particular programming. Um, the minimum, as you can tell, 600000 is uh, usually the minimum that a, a particular state will be awarded, but there have been you know, certain states like Alaska, Hawaii, um, that have had an upwards of $8 million in funding specifically just for YHDP. So um, it is out there and we are you know, hopefully going to be able to be in the running uh, as long as we continue to do what we need to do and develop, you know, the program, the supported that we need in order to apply for the funding. Um, our next funding round is next year. So that would be in, I believe, June uh, of 2024. And we need to be prepared, um, obviously, ahead of time before that in order to even attempt to apply. So um, we're going to use some of the funds that were already available um, for the new project and offer a variety of additional eligible activities. So um, with YHDP, it is really open as far as what it is that we're capable of doing. It does not have to be strictly housing or strictly um, homeless drop-in services for youth. Um, there is a pretty vast, um, gr there's gray area, you know, where we're able to really kind of work through. So the really good thing is seemingly they understand uh, that, you know, our youth don't fit into a box and most are not, you know, our typical clients um, that, you know, can you can check off, yes, we did this, yes, we did that. Uh, but there's many layers and the funding supports that. So next slide, please. Okay, so you all are able to obviously read off of the slide itself, but um, the YAB integration, again, is definitely one of the uh, biggest supporting factors um, that we're going to need to focus on. Um, and then, of course, do we need it in the community? Um, most of you, if you work with youth, already know that it's a very difficult population to count. Uh, and then to also define, I guess, if you will, what homelessness looks like. Um, a lot of our youth don't consider themselves homeless, you know, if they are bouncing from place to place or, you know, couch surfing 
uh, as long as they have a place to lay their head at night, they don't always consider themselves homeless. So we need to do more work in determining need. Um, collaboration is definitely going to be key. This is absolutely a group project, if you will. Take us back to high school and college. Um, everybody will need to be involved in order to make this work. It is a large undertaking, but I do believe that we can do it. And I do believe that most of us, um, especially on this call, are absolutely, you know, in going to be in unison as far as, you know, working towards the, the development for the YHDP application. Um, data and capacity is definitely an area that I think we all talk about all the time where we struggle just in regards to being able to count the population, to have up-to-date data, uh, and then to make sure that the data is accurate. So uh, I do know um, PFLAG and was working, and uh, I believe DHSS was working with the University of Delaware in order to, um, you know, start to collect some of this data. Um, we also collect, you know, data with these that come in through our drop-in center, but one of the things that will be extremely helpful and put us in a better position is to make sure that all of the players that are involved, that we're collecting the same data, um, that we're all speaking the same language, so we can actually bring it together across the whole state and, you know, be able to show what it is that the need is. Um, so that is something that's going to be really important also. Um, rural bonus, so that is something because we obviously have Sussex County that is going to work towards our favor also and, and we can add more points um, towards the application because we can include Sussex County. So we definitely need some more partners, um, you know, that are involved in Sussex. Um, I'll put make sure that my email address is in the chat so that way everybody has that. Um, and if you are interested uh, and wanting to be able to participate, gain information, um, ask more questions, attend meetings, things like that, um, we are working towards it. So again, I'll put my information in the chat. Um, at this point, West End, we're just really working more as the organizer um, to kind of bring this together. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a community effort. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Oh, there's my email address. There you go. Okay. So uh, as far as the uh, providers are concerned, again, anybody working with you, um, it's across the whole state is, is what we need to be involved um, because of the fact that the community need, the community portion of this is, is so huge. Um, we do want everybody involved as much as possible. So making sure that um, the players that want to be involved stay involved. This is not a show up to one or two meetings type of thing. We have to, it's a planning committee, a working committee um, that we have to be able to develop with youth, for youth, um, and then for them to be able to lead it. So it will take a lot of effort and support on, on all of our ends to be able to come together to do that. So we're looking to try to figure out how uh, we do that across the state, how we can, you know, make sure that Sussex is able to, um, you know, coordinate with, with Newcastle County and vice versa, and obviously Kent County in between. So uh, please reach out. Uh, again, my, my email address is there. It's much easier to get me by email than phone, and I will respond to you as quickly as possible. Um, if I do not have the answers, I am happy to put you in touch with the people who do. And again, <clears throat> excuse me again, we'll need to be working together to make sure that we're supporting um, our COC uh, because they're going to be the ones that have to complete the application while we do the work on the front end. Um, I saw something in the chat about ages. Um, so this is, we're right now, things are still very up in the air. It can support anywhere between 13 to 24 um, years of age. We are potentially looking in regards to building the YAB um, to be able to support, um, for them to be able to participate, excuse me, 18 to 24 years of age. So we're here. Um, please email me again, and I am happy to include you on any information that we have so far. Um, we do have um, a PowerPoint presentation um, that was set, set up yesterday, again, by the National Network for Youth. They provided some really great information, and I'm happy to send that out. Um, and then lastly, in uh, Philadelphia tomorrow. So Philadelphia was just awarded um, for their YHD program. So they are actually doing an event in Love Park tomorrow from, I believe it's 2 to 6 p.m. Um, I will be happy to share that flyer also. It's free to the public. Um, and it's going to be a youth-led event to spread awareness uh, in Love Park. So please shoot me an email. Happy to forward the information. 
and anyone have questions? I'm looking at the chat also, so both of you could help me. I am trying to scan as well too. It doesn't look like I see anything recent in the chat. If anybody okay. would like to unmute and ask a question or put a question in there. Um, and again, if not, I'm sure that Stacey will probably end up getting a couple emails um, throughout the week as well with maybe anybody following up too. Awesome, thank you. All righty, thank you again so much. Um, and if you'd like to, you're more than welcome to send that flyer to me and I can always include that in the um, meeting materials for, um, for our folder for today as well too. Will do, thank you. Thank you. All righty, um, and next we have, um, Jean Briggs, she is the our McKenny Vento um, liaison with Seaford. She is going to be discussing um, education rights for youth experiencing homelessness. Um, and Jean, whenever you are ready, please just let me know. And I'm can... ready. You can go to the first slide. Thank you. <laughs> um, this is the McKenny Vento Act that um, every su student succeeds in 2015, and that just assures that um, kids um, have school stability. And so that's the purpose of this um, act is that even though everything else is going wrong in their life, the one thing that they have that they can count on is their school is stable and they're able to stay in their school no matter where they move to. Next slide. Um, the Delaware Department of Education and Delaware Schools adhere to the provision of the federal McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act, which aims to minimize the educational disruptions experienced by students who are experiencing homelessness. We find out that every time the student's um, school is disrupted, they're behind in their education by six to eight months. So that's why school stability is very important for our homeless students. Next slide. Um, the Assistant Acts talks about living in emergency and transitional shelters, um, abandoned hospitals, having primary nighttime residence that is public or private, living in cars, parks, migratory students, living in circumstances as described. So most of our homeless students are either what we call doubled up. They're living with another family and at any time they can be put out. And the second highest is living in motels or shelters. Next slide. The causes of homelessness we know is the lack of affordable housing. That's the biggest piece right now for my families and my students here in Delaware is the lack of affordable housing. Um, uh, one bedroom, two bedroom in Seaford is $1,500 a month. Um, and the average that they're making at a chicken plant is anywhere between 16 and 19, uh, $19 an hour. So they can't even afford that. Um, poverty, um, increase in the low versus middle wage employment, health problems, lack of health insurance, addiction um, in Seaford, uh, particularly we have a large addiction um, problem. Um, we have at least three facilities right near each other where um, they go get their suboxone. So we see a lot of that in Seaford and mental health. Domestic violence, not so much. Um, natural disasters, not so much. Abuse, neglect, and family dysfunction. Um, we are on the rise for unaccompanied youth. I normally have maybe one or two. This year I've had 10. Next slide. The barriers to education for homeless children and youth there are a lot of stereotypes of a lack of awareness. Um, we have um, uh, under identification, we have kind of tackled that problem in every um, welcome back packet and in every enrollment. I have a form and it's called the um, Delaware McKinney Vento Student Residency Questionnaire. And on it has a list of four questions. And the first question is, is your current address temporary living arrangement? If they check yes, immediately uh, my department is called and we are calling this family to check out their um, housing situation to determine whether they're homeless or not and what services that we can help them with. Um, the enrollment requirements, um, even if they don't have everything they need, um, it is still immediate enrollment if they are homeless. 
Um, and then we work with them. Um, our department takes them to get the health records or we call the schools for the school records, or we go out to get proof of residency and help them with guardianship. Um, core health, fatigue and hunger. Uh, we've kind of combated that. I have a food pantry here and they can access food um, uh, once a month. They have they get 50 pounds of food and we're helped by the um, Harry Kay Foundation. And uh, also we have the backpack program. So every weekend, the kids in all six schools, K to 12, they can um, pick up a backpack and take it home for the weekend so they won't have food insecurity. Um, emotional trauma, depression, anxiety. We have enlisted a lot of mental health um, providers such as Milestones and other ones because we know that with homelessness, there's a lot of trauma. And especially when we had COVID, um, we had a lot of trauma because some of the, our families that were in the hotels were being molested. So um, our team uh, made it necessary that those students who were in hotels got first dibs and coming back to school full time during COVID because we knew that they were safer here at the school. Um, lack of transportation, that's not a problem. For our families, we send out vans or buses to make sure that they, um, wherever they move to, that transportation is sent to pick them up. Um, lack of supplies and clothing, um, we don't have that problem. Um, in August, we will supply all of our homeless students with backpacks and all their supplies to start their school year off. Also, um, if they need um, to refresh their supplies during the school year, we, we check with families and we do that. We've also partnered with Clothing Our Kids. So clothing is not a problem. In August, I'll call all the families and find out what their sizes are. And I'll have um, Clothing Our Kids provides four outfits, underwear, socks, and shoes, belts, uh, coats in the wintertime. So they get clothing twice. They get it um, in the summertime and the wintertime. So that hasn't been a problem for our kids. Um, because we've supplied all of those things to our kids, whether it be food, whether it be clothing supplies, transportation and clothing, um, when we look at our statistics academically, um, all of our um, K to six students have passed every year. Um, oh, well, K to eight. And then our high school kids have um, passed and been on honor roll. So we have statistics to prove that if you provide all those things and take away all those barriers, the students can um, and will survive in school and do well. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, Jean. So um, this was actually, we had a video clip. Um, Ruth Uvi with the Department of Education was um, so kind enough to actually pre-record a lot of a lot of information. Um, we are going to make sure that we're also accompanying, including this video um, with the uh, materials that we'll be sending out later too. But this was just a little bit of a clip of some of her, um, some of the updated information that she had on her end for some of the um, numbers of people experiencing homelessness, and then she has a little bit of information. So we were planning on hopefully playing this clip, crossing my fingers, it works on my end. Um, I wanna answer one question, Valerie Bradshaw. So what was happening was, we uh, what was reported to us from the police department, because we're in <clears throat> partnership with the Blades and the Seifert uh, Police Department, when things happen, um, they call in, to the counselors and that's how we got that information uh, about the molestation that was happening. And from, we partnered with the people in the motel, um, the owners, and they would tell us about the reported and the things that were happening on camera in the hallways. And so that's how we got our information. And I think there was one more question. Okay. I think is I think that was it. All right, Jean, thank you so much. I'm going to really fast um, flip on over to um, Ruth's video, but if anybody has any other follow up questions too, feel free to reach out to um, either of us. And again, we'll make sure that we include everything in the follow up as well. Um, and give me one moment. I'm going to hopefully play this clip. So in Delaware, during the last school school year of 21-22, not this one that we just finished, 
but in 21-22, statewide, we had 3,477 identified homeless children a year. Currently, with rising housing costs and higher expenses for daily living, such as groceries, homelessness is unfortunately increasing. The lack of a stable home can have severe impacts on the children and youth's ability to learn, to succeed in school, and to receive vital services from important organizations like homes. So you'll notice on this slide that there's an asterisk. And because Delaware is a small state, districts and charter schools with less than 15 students experiencing homelessness are redacted from this list, but they are included in the table. Bento, there are protections, as I mentioned, faith, education. And when students experience homelessness, they can remain enrolled in schools they have been attending, even if they no longer need residency permits, as I mentioned. So this means uh, they have the choice of school of origin they can attend. That is the school where they last attended, where they were currently housed, or the school in which the child was last at home. Or they can choose to be in the school of residence. Where the students were residing. So each public school district and charter school is required to have a mental laws that have been introduced repeatedly. What is directed to students and families experiencing homelessness to determine the needs of the mental laws program. Their educational best placement questions are whether they're going to attend um, or should they attend the school of origin or the school of residence. They ensure that these students are receiving. Steps. They help in maintaining employment documentation, information, and safe transportation. They can also um, provide referrals to other sources. Healthcare, mental health care needs, substance abuse. Um, they have a variety of other services in the community. Reminder uh, that this is one especially the pandemic that anyone can be homeless. Hey, so I think it's a little hard to hear. Um, we also, um, I think I we could just send it around to everyone at the end of this. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, absolutely. I understand. And I do apologize about that. Um, but we will make sure that the um, video is sent out again to everyone afterwards. Brady. I actually, um, oh, I'm sorry. The one last thing I think that, um, just kind of discussing a little bit what we're going on um, with as far as like homeless, um, helping families prepare for the upcoming school year. Erin, did you wanna cover the children education, education rights policy? I'm happy to. Um, thank you, um, Jean, for providing um, so much information related to um, Sussex County and kind of um, what uh, the McKinney-Vento uh, liaisons take care of um, down there and throughout the state. Um, one additional um, thing that we wanted to go over was the COC's policy related to um, homeless youth um, and education rights. Um, so anybody uh, in the state who receives uh, federal HUD funding, so that's COC funded projects, ESG funded projects, um, any projects with federal funding uh, through the Department of Housing and Urban Development that serve uh, children uh, and families experiencing homelessness um, are required to have a policy uh, um, that states uh, how they ensure that uh, uh, families and children within their programs understand their education rights uh, and get connected to the school districts uh, and the liaisons to ensure that their education is not interrupted um, due to experiencing homelessness. Um, so uh, this is uh, the COC's policy. Um, it's a COC-wide policy. Um, it, it, within that, it does have a sample provider policy. Um, so we just wanted to uh, make everyone aware that uh, this policy is uh, um, available um, and can be utilized as a resource for any federally funded uh, providers um, serving families. Uh, and uh, we will also be uh, putting all of the COC policies to a community comment period during our membership drive this year. Uh, so anybody who is interested in reviewing this and providing any comment on how it can be improved or any changes or anything like that, um, it's a available um, on our governance page, uh, and you can also uh, access it through that link there. Um, so the COC 
wide policy uh, that can be implemented uh, at the project level. That's it. All right, thank you so much. Um, if we don't have any other questions, we are going to move on. And Sarah, I do apologize. I think we had a little bit of a change. We are going to be hopping around a bit and I believe we are actually going to have, oh, I'm sorry, um, John Whitelaw and uh, Marissa Brand with Classy actually pre present first and then we will be hopping back to Sarah. Um, John and Marissa, if you guys are all set, let me know and I can go ahead and get started. Uh, yes, I'm all set, thank you. Well, and I'm sorry, Marissa, is there a typo there? Is, you, is that, is, I'm sorry, should your last name be banned instead of brand? I apologize. Yeah, that's okay. I will no fix problem. that for you. I apologize. Alrighty. So hi everyone, I'm Marissa Band with the Disability Law Program. We're a project of Community Legal Aid Society Incorporated. Um, you can advance to the slide three. I'm gonna to try to go a little faster since we're running short on time. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, if you're not familiar with Community Legal Aid Society, we go by Classy for short. We are a not-for-profit <laughs> civil legal service provider. Um, so our services are free. Um, we have a number of different projects, including the Disabilities Law Project, and we are a statewide program. So we have an office in every county. Next slide. Um, first, we have our public benefits program that handles uh, issues with um, publicly funded benefits like uh, food stamps or SNAP, Medicaid, TANF, purchase of care. Um, so if you're encountering people that are having issues with being denied, having reductions or overpayments, uh, those are types of issues our public benefits program handles as well as certain social security matters. Next slide. Um, we have a housing and fair housing program, which Sarah will be talking about in more detail after my presentation. Next slide. Uh, we have a domestic violence program, medical legal partnerships and immigration program. So we provide immigration representation for non-citizens who live in Delaware who are victims of domestic violence, violent crime, uh, trafficking as well as children who are unaccompanied um, and have been uh, victims of abuse, um, abandonment, neglect, or crime. Our domestic violence unit handles representation for survivors uh, seeking protection from abuse and related petitions in uh, Kent and Sussex County. And then our medical legal partnerships are collaborations between healthcare providers and legal aid to address the unmet legal needs um, patients are having that um, are barriers to um, good health. Uh, so it's a social determinant of health model trying to address those issues to um, uh, remove those negative factors in the individual's lives. Next slide. We have an elder law program for individuals ages 60 and up. It focuses on things like advanced planning, um, certain deed changes, consumer matters, um, like contractors who are exploiting seniors, um, fraud, um, preventing unnecessary guardianship, manufactured housing issues, and uh, domestic violence. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, one second. I'm sorry. Okay, so Disabilities Law Program, which is the program I'm with, is uh, the protection and advocacy system for the state of Delaware. Each state and territory has a protection and advocacy system or PNA. We provide free legal services to protect the rights of people with disabilities within Delaware. Um, this includes information, referrals, advice, representation on individual complaints, um, class action and systemic complaints and litigation. In addition to traditional legal practice, we also um, have federal authority to be independent monitors of facilities that serve individuals with disabilities. So we can go into facilities um, like group homes, psychiatric hospitals, um, and other locations like schools um, 
to monitor and make sure that um, no abuse, neglect, or human rights violations are happening. Um, we also have the ability to conduct investigations when we have probable cause to believe abuse or neglect of a person with a disability has happened. Next slide. Um, the PNA movement is born out of the deinstitutionalization movement, movement. So that's something um, that's important to keep in mind when you're thinking about our role as the PNA and disability rights generally. Um, so the, the movement really got started after an expose um, was done on the Willowbrook School in New York. Um, there, uh, it was discovered that the residents were living in really horrific conditions, often kept naked, were uh, abused physically, sexually, emotionally, were used as research subjects. Um, all of the you know, parade of horrible things that you um, can imagine were unfortunately done to these children. Um, and it was actually Geraldo Rivera, um, that did the report back when he was um, a news reporter and it got national attention. Um, and so the protection and advocacy system was established to have authority to go in to make sure things like what were happening at Willowbrook did not happen again to other individuals with disabilities. So there's really a historical focus on um, moving people from institutions into the community um, and integration to the greatest extent possible. Next slide. So the types of cases that we take, we take legal, um, legal issues that have some type of connection to disability. So we take issues with DVR, vocational rehabilitation, special education, um, students who are facing severe expulsion, severe dis discipline like expulsion. Um, we handle certain public benefits cases that are tied to disability, like uh, SSI and SSDI cessations, uh, Medicaid waiver issues and eligibility, um, as well as um, coverage. So if someone who needs a particular medical device or medication and it's denied by the Medicaid MCO, um, we help with those appeals. We also cover um, assistive technology advocacy, including um, if someone sold an AT device that's a lemon, um, we address any barrier for someone who's currently on SSI or SSDI that's preventing them or making it hard for them um, to keep a job or get a job. Um, so that could be housing, that could be work, that could be an expungement or pardon. Next slide. Um, we help with uh, discrimination and accessibility in places of public accommodation and government services. Um, so someone who's applying for um, food stamps, for example, SNAP, and needs an American Sign Language interpreter to uh, complete the app application. If they were denied that request, that would be um, an example of a case that we would, um, that we would take. Uh, abuse and neglect, like I talked about, um, housing, reasonable accommodations, issues with zoning, um, individuals with behavioral health conditions who are at risk of losing their housing due to um, symptoms um, or behavior they're exhibiting. Uh, we have a grant just specifically for voting rights and advocacy around voting for people with disabilities to make sure, for example, polling places are accessible. Um, that you know, electronic ballots work with screen readers, that sort of thing. Um, we also help people who are having an issue with their representative payee, which is someone who handles um, money for someone on social security. Um, and finally, um, alternatives to guardianship and other barriers to community integration. Next slide. So just very quickly, um, there are several laws that protect people with disabilities within um, Delaware, um, one of which is the Americans with Disability Act, which most um, individuals are at least um, somewhat familiar with. It has uh, different titles um, of the law. One applies to employment, one to services from state and local governments, one to what it calls public accommodations, which is basically a business that provides services. Um, to the public. 
telecommunication, and then others. Next slide. Um, things that the ADA provides is that um, a covered entity, like a business or a housing provider, may have to make changes to their policies and practices um, as an accommodation of someone with disabilities. They can't limit or segregate or classify people with disabilities in an adverse way. They can't have a program that screens out people with disabilities, um, services, that are provided by public entities must be integrated. Um, and then another federal law, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act offers similar protections for ent entities that receive federal funding. Next slide. Um, common issues, uh, physical access literally can't get in the building, can't get in the room, can't get on the exam table having eligibility criteria that has the impact of excluding people with disabilities, um, failures to communicate is a major one, like the ESL example that I gave earlier, and refusal to make reasonable accommodations and modifications. Next slide. Reasonable accommodations and modifications. I like this graphic because it's a nice way to represent how sometimes you have to treat someone differently to treat them equally. And a reasonable accommodation and reasonable modifications is an example of that, where you may have to make changes to programs and services so that a person with a disability can equally benefit from them. Next slide. Um, so common accommodations, interpreters, large font, um, captioning, use of assistive technology. Um, next slide. Uh, another major one, I apologize for the formatting, uh, didn't transfer here, but um, service animals. Uh, service animals is a major accommodation that people may need. Um, and so one example would be in, in um, a motel or um, other uh, temporary housing situation. If someone has a service animal, um, the no pet policy, waiving that um, would be an example of reasonable accommodation so that their service animal can live with them and um, provide their services. Service animals uh, have to be trained to do specific tasks to help the person with the disability. So that's a difference with emotional support animal, which you'll um, likely hear about in Sarah's presentation. And I think that's a good segue to move over to Sarah. Um, there's some additional information in the PowerPoints. Um, so take a look at that when you get the materials. Alrighty, Marissa, thank you so much. Um, I am going to real quick hop over to Sarah's slide. Um, thank you again for all of your information and we'll make sure all the slides are included in our meeting materials when we send them out to everybody. All righty. There, of course, this is being slow. Oh, hey. uh, can you give me a time check? No. Oh yes, I'm sorry, it's 1147. Um, we have a, um, one more presentation after you that's going to be Darlene and then a quick few moments for updates. I'm sorry, my thing is being slows. Give you a moment. All right, so like less than five minutes, I can do it. And again, all of this information is going, we'll make sure that we send it out. Um, that's fine. So I'm gonna start talking. Yes. Um, and actually, if you just want to start with slide nine, which is says eviction at the top with the little house at the bottom, I think we can just start there. Perfect. So, um, hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Ryan. I'm the uh, managing attorney of the housing unit at Class E. Um, and I see that there's a hand raised. I don't know if we want to oh, yes, do that first. That was a quick question I had about service animals and making a reasonable accommodations for them, what would you do if you have a emergency shelter and you don't have all of your spaces are public? So how do you make a reasonable accommodation for a service animal um, without infringing on everyone else's rights for people who may have allergies and things of that nature since everything is communal? Marissa, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, so, um... There is actually some DOJ guidance on this. Um, if there are both individuals with allergies and individuals with a service animal, you have to um, 
do your best to accommodate them both. Um, so I don't know what that looks like in your particular space. I can't give legal advice in this form, form, format, but um, you would need to attempt to provide reasonable accommodations to both if that, um, if you have both someone with a severe allergy that rises to that level and someone with a service animal. Interesting, thank you. Khadija. Yes. It's Deidre from Childland, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, I know we are short on time and I, I want our presenters to be able to get all that information out. I am, this is an issue that comes up at our shelter um, quite often. And so I've been more than happy to um, share with you how we work around those um, accommodations off outside of this meeting. Okay, I just put my work number in the chat. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm having Sophie skip to slide 24 of my presentation because we know the seconds are ticking and I think this topic is really important and I think we should use our couple minutes on this. So um Sarah, I apologize. I don't have the slide numbers up with me. If oh, you just let me know it just says right reasonable up. accommodations at the top. It's the one before the hexagonals. Okay, I um, apologize. And my no problem. Uh, it's totally fine. So um, a reasonable accommodation is any change to a rule or a policy that someone has that in housing is necessary for the person to have equal access and to use and enjoy the housing. And so the reason Marissa said, you know, we can't give you specific legal advice is that these changes to rules and policies are kind of within um, the world that you're living in, right? And so if you flip to the next slide, Sophie, um, oops, that's not mine. Uh, it's a slide with like hexagonal things on it. I can just keep talking. I'm sorry. So that's okay. They're like three and a brownish. There you go. So reasonable accommodation requests have to be um, granted. So if someone says, hey, I need a service animal or emotional support animal, they have to be granted unless that request is not related to the disability that it would pose an undue financial or administrative hardship to the housing provider, or it would fundamentally alter the nature of the program. And you can tell everyone on this call is gonna go, oh, I'm a service provider and that's stupid language, right? How are we supposed to know what's a fundamental alteration of the program? This is where our kind of common sense comes in. So um, as Marissa said, I don't wanna give legal advice, but you know, if you have, um, individual rooms and someone asking to bring their service animal into their individual room, certainly that is a different consideration. It's not a fundamental alteration of the program for that service animal to be in a, in a private space with that individual. If you are in, um, you know, code blue housing or code purple housing or code orange housing, where there's, you know, shelter space with many cots close together, there might be a different consideration of whether there's a need for fundamental altering, fun, fundamental altering the program. Um, it, these reasonable accommodation requests for service animals or for any other change to the program. And so again, just use my couple minutes to kind of drill down on this particular topic. Um, Reasonable accommodations could be, I get my check, my social security check or my benefits check on the seventh of every month. I'm supposed to pay my rent on the first of every month. I ask for accommodation so that I can pay my rent on the 15th. That is not an undue financial burden on my landlord. That isn't a fundamental change to the program. It is related to my disability needs. That's a perfect example of a reasonable accommodation that should be granted, right? Some other examples would be someone who has mobility impairments and needs to reside on the ground floor. They cannot, mob their mobility impairment means that they cannot use stairs. 
that is a reasonable accommodation. If there's a ground floor apartment available or ground floor unit available, that is something that should be granted. That doesn't fundamentally alter anything or cause undue burden to give someone a, a unit that they can access. And to kind of pivot and use this last 30 seconds, I know I have 30 seconds. Um, the other piece that I wanted to talk about was reasonable modifications. So that is when you are asking for a physical modification of the unit. So to use my ground floor access, um, if the client or an the individual ha has a ground floor unit with one step, like one uh, door step to get in. This is really common, particularly in Wilmington, right? That there's kind of a threshold step to get into the unit. Putting in a ramp so that that person can access the unit is asking for a reasonable modification. Um, that should be granted by the landlord. If there's anybody who's dealing with any of these issues and they're, they're, we can talk more and more and more about it, um, feel free to contact me. I will put my information in the chat. You can reach out to me afterwards, but I wanted to make sure that we kind of said reasonable accommodation and reasonable modification and talked for that three minutes about those two things. Thanks so much, Sophie. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I do apologize that, you know, um, we had so many great presentations trying to fit them all in two hours is a little tough. Um, we will make sure that all the slides you um, have will be sent out to everybody and included in the meeting materials folder as well. Thank you again so much. Um, so for our final presentation here, give me one moment while I find that. We actually have Darlene Sturgeon with us from the um, Department of Deve Developmental Disabilities. Um, Darlene, would you prefer to screen share or would you have um, whatever works easier for you? Um, if you can go ahead and give slides and we'll, we'll go through them real quick. And again, they're going to be included uh, in the materials that are going to be sent out to you. So we're just going to do a quick overview of really what the division um the homeless issues, the, home, the um, housing insecurities that the people that we serve uh, may experience. So the mission of the Division of Developmental Disabilities is valuing, a person, valuing persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities, honoring abilities, respecting choice, achieving possibilities, and working together to support healthy, safe, and fulfilling lives. Next. So what we do as a division, we operate the Medicaid Home and Community Service-Based Waiver, which is the 19C Lifespan Waiver. This enables um, uh, federal payments and federal, federal subsidies for uh, service supports for housing and other uh, life transact, uh, individual life uh, activities. We also operate the Pathways to Employment State Amended Plan. This is for the uh, younger adults with disabilities who want to work. We manage a provider network of um, amazing, amazing providers that provide services and supports to the individuals that we serve. We also operate a 54-bed ICF facility in Georgetown, uh, the Stokely Center, which probably most people are um, aware of, and that serves a population that, is a, that has a little bit higher uh, medical acuity requirements and service requirements. Uh, next. So our main thing is that we promote and we support a person's right to self-advocacy and having a voice uh, in making decisions across all parts of their life. And this is done through the person-centered planning approach. So it is, what is what does this person's best life look like? What is their goal and their objective in life? And how can we help them and support them in making that happen? Uh, next. So um, this is just the criteria of eligibility for the people that we serve. So and again, it'll be in the reference materials. So we go next. So the housing insecurities really that we face are the obstacles that the individuals that we serve face. Um, affordability and accessibility is among the number one obstacles because the people that we serve that are, are receiving services from our division are low and extremely low income. Um, they are looking for housing opportunities that have modifications such as wheelchair access, widened doors, ramps, grab bars, and other home modifications that contribute to quality of life. So that's the first obstacle. So finding that partnering of affordability with accessibility, that already takes you from a lot of, you know, an available inventory in the community down to a very smaller amount of availability. Um, we do have emergency placement situations where we have um, a caregiver that may pass. You know, what happens in the middle of the night when you have an adult caregiver that is caring for their adult child? 
um, you know, with a disability, that has been the how that has been the the life structure, and that has been the everything. So you know, we've got to take care of that in the middle of the evening. Um, majority of the people we serve, we serve over five thousand individuals. A majority of them do live at home with loved ones, but we're seeing an increase of people that they want to live independently. So we're really trying to address that. Um, another emergency placement situation that we find um, not only the death of a caregiver, but eviction from current housing. I think in, in another um, presentation earlier, we talked about, um, you had seen that there are evictions that that um, result out of behaviors or, or I would say more of a lack of understanding of the community around the individual. Um, so having that really narrow lens of what an individual is capable of, that, that becomes a, a very large obstacle. Uh, leaving an institution, so any kind of institutional setting, it uh, could be uh, anything from uh, previous residence at Stokely Center to ultimately transition in the community, which would be a great transition. We would love to see that. Um, but also someone leaving, uh, you know, someone that's currently incarcerated and coming into um, community placements, making sure that, you know, they're approved for services, making sure that they have a place to go upon, you know, um, uh, leaving the institution. So that that becomes a little bit of an obstacle. And these are all things that we kind of scramble, unfortunately, to kind of solve. Um, housing discrimination, again, having that narrow lens of what someone what someone's ability is and what somebody's um, good life looks like. Um, I'm finding uh, among landlords and potential landlords that I interact with, they have a very, very narrow view of what our individuals um, do in their life and the things and the amazing things that they accomplish every day in their life. Um, availability of housing with supported housing services. We really, permanent supportive housing is what we need and we need a variety of housing types. We do, we have every kind of demand from single apartments for people that live on their own that work that we have all the way to um, group homes. So we have a very wide spectrum of housing needs. So we are looking in every day and reaching out with partnerships and having great, great progress with the housing authority on new and unique housing opportunities for the people that we serve. And we're very, very excited about that. But these are kind of the main obstacles, affordable, affordability, accessibility combined together, the emergency placements, because our situations come up so quickly. Um, leaving an institution, we have a little bit more planning there. But the housing discrimination, you know, in that narrow lens of the community of what are the individuals we serve are, are capable of doing. Um, next. Um, the funding that we have to address the housing insecurities of the people that we serve, we do not, unfortunately, have any specific funding for a homelessness initiative. What we do have, we have access to a limited number of SRAP vouchers that we are um, granted by the housing authority. Um, we do coordinate and help um, individuals advocate um, for state services. We, we help them in identifying other services throughout the states that might be um, appropriate for them. But ultimately, we end up using our general funds, our operating funds, to um, fill the gap in emergency housing situations. So um, that's a very down and dirty, very quick, but you can kind of see what the main themes, uh, you have the next slide has contact information on there. Um, you are more than welcome to reach out to me uh, directly. That's the link to our website. My contact information is on the website again, um, but you see what the theme is and 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 really the, the partnerships we need to have to these things. And I think working with Classy, working with the Housing Authority and everyone on this call just really can help enlighten and engage the community for a better understanding and, and better opportunities so that everyone we serve can live their best life. Thank you, Darlene. That was very well said. Um, again, I apologize for being a little bit short on time. We will make sure that all of your materials are again included um, with the materials that we'll be sending out later today, as well as the recording. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but I'm sure that you're going to probably get some follow-ups at some point. Um, and if anything comes up, I will let you know, but we are going to real quick move through 
some of our upcoming events and announcements. Um, again, Aaron did cover this in more detail. We have our next meeting is going to be, um, the next quarterly meeting will be in October, 2023. Um, once we have more details, we will make sure to send that out to everybody. And in the meantime, please feel free to pre-register or reach out to either myself or Felicia with any questions. Um, thank you again, everybody. We will be making sure to send out um, the video recording as well as all the meeting materials um, within a few days or so to make sure that everybody has that um, available for, for them to review. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free, like I said, to reach out to any of our lovely presenters. They provided their information or to anyone with the COC team, either myself, Felicia, or Aaron. All right. Thank you again so much for joining us and I hope everybody has a great rest of their day.